panel discussion topic, we will talk about discovering hidden fortunes with asset tokenization. Let's welcome our next panelist, Elfin Luvar, angel investor and entrepreneur of Startup Studio. Yeah, you may take the second seat. Okay, yep, the second one. Yeah, second one. Cool. And we'll have Fon Dao, CEO and co-founder of IV.1 Limited. All right, then we have Jason Fernandez, co-founder of Adlunum. Yep, make sure you sit under your pictures. <laughs> and we also have Young Kim, CMO of Alicia. And this session will be moderated by George Shabashio. Um, co-founder of EcoX, George De Sechichios. Hello, good, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, hopefully everybody is doing good. Uh, recuperated from lots of uh, speeches, coffee, side events. So it's been very, very busy uh, during this uh, Wow Summit. I, I usually like to keep things fairly relaxed and entertaining at the same time. I actually changed my jacket just so that I can compete a little bit here with my friend, Ivan, for many years. Um, myself, uh, I'm Portuguese-Canadian, but I've been in this space technology for 36 years, but specifically in blockchain for seven years. Out of this, 27 has been in the Middle East, Asia, Africa as well. So I've so what I want is each of the panelists to spend maybe two minutes introducing themselves and then we'll dwell into the um, asset tokenization space and how to move forward. Evan. Thank you, George. Uh, pleasure to be here, guys, and thank you for your time. Uh, I'm Evan Lutra. I'm an angel investor, parallel entrepreneur, been building and investing in fast growing technology companies since uh, over a decade now. Uh, bought my first Bitcoin in 2014. Uh, didn't really get involved in the space until 2016, deeper, when I was an early investor in companies like Hedera Hashgraph, XRP Ripple, equity investors, at around 10 million valuations. Uh, did about uh, over two dozen investments between 2016 to 2018. Many of them did really well, Ecomi, Beef Collectibles, et cetera, that many did over 100x realized, and I realized this is the future, this is where I want to focus my time. Uh, before that, I already had over 100 plus investments in the Web2 space, and I was also pretty bullish on technology generally. Uh, but now I'm pretty much mostly focused on Web3 for now. In the last three to four years, I've invested in over 300 private sales, advised over 40 companies from pre-listing to listing, delivering hundreds of millions of dollars of volume on day one with 50 to 100x return for our investors. Uh, right now, pretty much, uh, right for all the top tier media, Cointelegraph, uh, Forbes, Cryptonomics, Entrepreneur, Hacker Noon, many more, have about 2 million people who follow me across various different social media platforms, and I can add value to projects from credibility, community, and capital, right? So these are the three things that I can bring to the table. Uh, looking for all kinds of deals, all kinds of investment opportunities. So if somebody is building something great, please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Yes, go ahead. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Fong. I look Asian, but I'm from Germany. So overall, what we're doing is we're building a digital asset infrastructure. We're one of the leading ones in Europe. We tokenized over 20 kind of different asset classes. And uh, what we're doing right now, we're not only in Germany, we're building a global tech. So it means like we're also like in Saudi Arabia, we're in Dubai. Yeah, we're exploring right now Hong Kong, South Africa, and uh, I'm really excited to be on the panel. Yeah, so overall, keep it quite short and relaxed. No problem. You also have the right family name, Dao. Exactly, Everybody exactly. Everybody knows what yeah. a Dao is, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go to <laughs> Jason. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Fernandez. I'm a co-founder of Adlunum. Uh, it's an engaged to earn NFT-based launchpad. Uh, what we do is sort of help companies in the lead-up to their IDO or, or their IEO. Uh, essentially provide them everything from advisory support, tokenomic support, marketing support, uh, really everything that they need to do to be highly successful and sometimes even you know, introduce them to exchanges. We have partnered with some of the biggest exchanges uh, in the world. Uh, my background is investments, uh, so made a couple hundred investments through NFT technologies uh, over the past year uh, and, and essentially you know, helped a lot of companies get to the point where they were very, very successful uh, in their public race. Uh, like Sebastian, I'm Portuguese. Uh, and, uh, and sort of very happy to be here and I look forward to talking about asset tokenization. Yoon, uh, hey. from Korea. Correct. From Korea. Hey guys, uh, Yoon. Um, I'm the founder of Alicia. Uh, Alicia, we have been tokenizing real estate properties uh, since uh, 2018, uh, back when STOs were a fashion. 
Um, per, until now, we've uh, tokenized around 46 uh, properties, uh, residential and commercial properties, and have uh, around 20 million US dollars under assets um, under management. Um, more recently, uh, we've been tokenizing other real world assets, uh, including art uh, and cars. So um, anything that has to do with the tokenization and the, re the regulatory compliance related to um, you know the securitization tokenization in Korea, um, I think we're uh, pretty much experts there. So looking forward to the panel and I'm looking forward to speak with you guys. I think the title of the panel is about gems in the area of tokenization. As you know, the most popular token in usage today although they mention it's a utility to token, it's actually a tokenization of money, which is actually USDT. It was originally created by a good friend by the name of Brock Pierce in conjunction with a few other pioneers. But I think following that, that's pretty boring tokenization. Then I think the next one was probably real estate that took the most um, traction. But beyond real estate, there is tokenization of commodities like gold, silver, and others tokenization of shares, bonds, art, collectibles. But I think there's a lot of potential innovation of other items that we could or we should or we should explore tokenization. So maybe I want our panelists to try to dwell into what they think are some of the opportunities that they think are important for tokenization as we move forward. Fun. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, I, I believe uh, we're going to live in a world of tokens eventually from everything can be tokenized to an extent. And I believe the best case scenario is that we would tokenize all kinds of assets. I've already seen that happening, right? I mean, he just said he's tokenized all different types of asset classes. I am already advising companies like Tangible, which have tokenized real estate portfolios worth $30 million also. And I think what's interesting, though, is to see how we tokenize assets who have not already been tokenized and how the regulation comes into play when you have tokenized assets and provide liquidity to assets which did not have the liquidity before and making it convenient and easy to trade these assets. Right now, if you buy land or if you buy property, there you have to go through so much legal hurdles. You have to go through so much paperwork. The opportunity that tokenization brings is that I can buy and sell land at the click of a button as an NFT and while I'm sitting here in two seconds. I think that's the real opportunity that tokenization brings. I think a lot of people do mistake that tokenizing assets which lack liquidity in the real world will suddenly get liquidity in the crypto world. I don't think that is the big, big opportunity here. I don't think that's the right way to look at it. I think it's about bringing uh, tokenized, tokenization to assets which already have liquidity, which already have demand, but they don't have an easy way. There's no convenient way to trade them. And I think that's what the real opportunity with tokenization is. Yeah, and to, ex to expand a bit about what uh, Evan was saying, real estate is a great example, right? Because they've always been sort of the ability to buy timeshares. Uh, but lately, you know, uh, with, with real estate tokenization, I'm an advisor in a company called FOHO, which does, you know, uh, fractional home ownership, allows you to sort of literally buy, you know, what is effectively a timeshare, access to properties, uh, and then flip them, right? So one of the biggest problems with timeshares is you can't sell them. There's actually entire companies that have started up literally to get you out of timeshares uh, because, because trading them is, is really difficult. And really, if you think about it, what you need is access to a property at a certain time. You don't need to own that. Right? You need essentially fractional ownership of it. You, and, and so asset tokenization allows you to do that. So I think real estate is actually one of probably the, the, the easiest uh, things to, to tokenize and, and, and the greatest value that you can see. Yeah, I, th I think uh, this is a key point in the sense that if you know tokens have 32 decimal points, so fractionalization is a key element. You can divide everything into a very small unit so somebody can invest a very small amount and benefit. But Fong, go ahead. Yes. Uh, overall, I totally agree with you guys, but uh, one thing we are definitely missing is, for example, what's the target group even? Yeah, if it's like, uh, are we targeting, for example, private investors, like retail people, or it's like for professionals, for institutionals, so it's a different kind of process behind it. And uh, what's definitely here on the market is that real estate is the easiest and simplest way to understand tokenization of assets. Why? Because, for example, right now, if I say, okay, you can have a piece of art, yeah, normally you have like this art somewhere in a safe, yeah, and then tokenize it, for example, yeah, or like a piece of NFT. But with the real estate, for example, if you say, hey, I live here in Hong Kong, for example, I tokenize the real estate, people can still walk by this real estate and say, like, okay, hey, this is a piece what I potentially will buy. Yeah, and uh, of course, like the idea is like tokenization of everything, but uh, always make it step by step, yeah, so that it's clear for which target group we're focusing on. Yeah, and the second thing is like really 
what's the real benefit out of it? Because fractionalization, yes, makes sense for retail, but fractionalization doesn't make sense, for example, for institutionals. Yeah, so definitely always look what's going on. Uh, Yun? Yeah, we've always been thinking about how we can bring um, or add value to our investors. And like, he's, like uh, Fong said, um, you know, there's different sex, uh, section of groups uh, that we cater towards. Um, for me, for doing uh, tokenization of real, real estate properties for a long time, we are also really concerned about the um, obtaining the legal rights for these investors because tokenization and having a digital ledger is one thing, but having actually actually having um, the authority to exercise the rights of this underlying property asset is uh, um, as important. And um, for Alicia, more recently, um, what we have done is uh, we we do we have two mechanisms. The first uh, way of uh, tokenizing real estate is to um, secure the underlying asset through an entity or a special uh, or a SPC, and then uh, having a shareholder list that we uh, register to the government in Korea and tell them that there's these uh, certain types of people or certain types of uh, money that's involved in this, uh, this tokenization of an asset. Second is, is, and this is more recently, and uh, is the secure, um, is issuing bonds, uh, issuing bonds that are secured loans. So we have real estate uh, property owners uh, that collateralize their real estate property, and uh, we and they um, um, issue bonds to the to the general public or to the crypto market, and in return uh, we generate yields from the loans, and then we offer those to. Um, you know, USDC and USDT uh, stablecoin uh, holders. And um, yeah, so there's, there's different types of customers groups, uh, different ways of doing it, but overall we, we try to do it um, under, the, uh, under the regulatory framework, which is also um, really uh, hard and important at the same time. Yeah, please go just, ahead. Just, just one question or two questions I want to ask here to the crowd. Who of you guys here owns cryptocurrencies? Everybody. Okay, Everybody. who of you guys here owns a security token? Okay, it's much less. Yeah, so that's exactly the There's still a big like, gap. Yeah. I, actually, I want to add a little bit more on real estate that I think is very important. Most of the assets, like whether it's gold or commodities, example, or even money, do not necessarily directly give benefit other than up or down uh, with the value of that asset. But real estate can have both an up and down swing uh, capitalization appreciation. But if you use the real estate to loan out or you turn it into a hotel, a school, a mall, you also have monthly returns from the operation of that real estate. So that means you can actually give extra benefits uh, to the users of that token. So one is the capital appreciation of the token. But the second thing is monthly returns or annual returns from actually owning that token. So let's pump up the volume a little bit into something more exotic. We heard about real estate, we heard about money. What about exotic assets, like for example, intangible assets? As you know, today in most companies, the biggest value that does not, is not always capitalized is intangible assets. Let's take some, a brand like Coca-Cola. The value of the brand is bigger than the operational of the brand. So how we go around and is tokenization of intangible assets something that we should explore? I think it's very much possible, right? And it's also exciting because eventually if you start tokenizing brands, you can also ride so much of like this the hype train in the crypto e economy. So I think it's actually very interesting. If you think about it right now, in the current world, if you some, ask somebody asks what's the best car to buy, somebody would say buy a Ferrari, buy a Lamborghini, right? But then let's say Honda and Toyota launch a token and you buy a bunch of Honda tokens, I buy a bunch of Toyota tokens, and then you ask me what's the best car to buy, I'm going to say buy a Toyota. Let's say buy a Honda because you get a part revenue of the company and possibly and you get a part, uh, you get to decide how the company is governed. Let's say Honda makes 10 billion a year and then they ask the token holders, should we invest in building a new airplane or should we invest in building a yacht? You're going to say invest in a plane because you like to fly a lot. I'll say invest in a yacht. I like to be on the water. So I think that's also the better part of tokenization. And I think when you tokenize these intangible assets, as you say, as its brand value, an IP, which is actually how the biggest companies in the world actually operate. All the profit is runs into companies that are just doing, that have basically shell companies that only own the IP. So I think tokenizing those uh, intangible assets is going to be very, very exciting in the future. It's, it's coming for sure. Yeah. 
your yeah. opinion on I, it. I also agree here. Yeah, I definitely like brand tokenization is something that will come up. But I'm not sure like if you're all aware of this, for example, in Germany, there was like Porsche. Yeah, and uh, they tried to tokenize their brand. Yeah, and bring out different kind of NFTs. And it totally failed. No, I think that was very different. So I know about, I do a lot of NFTs also in crypto. And Porsche messed up a launch because they did not focus on giving value to the user. Buying that NFT did not give you any claim to Porsche in any possible way. It was just saying, hey, look at me, I'm Porsche. Buy something because I'm selling it to you. Exactly, I totally agree. And but that's, that is not, that's and not. And, and that's exactly the point about tokenizing of brands, right? Because if you tokenize starting of brands or something like this, there has to be a value behind it. No, I think, yes. Yeah? I think you have to give, a, like, when I say tokenize the intangible value, I mean the intellectual property. For but, example. But exactly. Porsche or any, I don't know about Porsche generally, but if you look at Apple, where do they send most of their profit? Goes to Ireland. Why? Because they say that that company owns the intellectual property and we are just paying a fee to use that intellectual property. So if you tokenize the revenues of that intellectual property entity, then buying that token makes a lot of sense. Then you can get claims to dividends, to profits. I think that is what I mean, tokenizing actual intellectual properties, to actually actual underlying asset, which is the intellectual property, not just doing an NFT collection that says you can buy yeah. this just because you like the brand. Exactly, and that's exactly the point. Yeah, you always have to have like a real underlying asset behind it where you say, yeah. like, okay, it totally makes sense, even if it's like IP, if it's like, Music rights, whatever, right? 100%. So it's, like, it's going exactly into this kind of direction. Music rights is a great example. I, I invested in a company called Nebula, which does the exact same thing. So they are allowing artists to tokenize their royalties from future earnings. So now if, I, if I'm your friend, uh, I like your music, I give you $100 and I get your token. You know, you get $100 from 1,000 friends. That's all you need to launch your music. That kills the whole label industry. So this kind of disruption is going to be very, very exciting. I think that's what tokenization really gives us. It gives us the ability to disrupt existing models in a very unique way. And you can't really stop technical progress. You can only delay it. Jason. Yeah, I mean, the name of the game, the promise of tokenization is essentially, you know, representing value in a token, right? It's all about exchanging value. Uh, whatever it is that you're tokenizing has to have value. So it goes back to the Porsche thing. If you don't have value, you can't tokenize it. There's no use in tokenizing. It's not going to be it's not gonna be valuable. But once you have various different values represented as tokens, then they're tradable, right? Like that's the real promise of it. Because normally what happens is, you know, even if you had, were able to tokenize some sort of asset and, and explain, you know, represent it as a token, then you pretty much have to use fiat to, to purchase it. Fiat is always sort of the middle, the middle ground. Well, when it, the asset is tokenized, you can directly trade back and forth. So you have essentially like a, a, a translation between multiple different kinds of assets and just being able to move move capital and move value between them because the value is just represented by the token. So as long as you trade the token, you're trading the value. So I think that's the whole promise of asset tokenization in the first place. Yon. Yeah, um, we have been working uh, with um, artists uh, involved in um, the copyrights of art. Um, I think a lot of people don't know this, but when a collector buys physical art and puts it in an exhibition, the, the rights of the exhibition or the money that's generated from the exhibition doesn't go to the collector. It goes to the artist, the guy who, who created this art. So there is a, a streamline of, and logistics involved in um, ex exercising exhibition and copyrights and um, making, uh, gener making derivatives uh, from the specific artwork. Um, we've been trying to tackle this with NFTs, for instance, and, and, and the programmable nature of NFTs is, is, uh, is in a way uh, we can be able to streamline the logistics uh, involved in um, art copyrights and we try to um, see where this physical art is and try to transfer value uh, from from the uh, original collector to the artist and in and, and the end through the, into the audiences. Um, but yeah, I mean this is one form of intangible assets that we're tackling to but there's also so many issues that needs to be solved especially from doing something from physical to you know digital there's, there's a bridge, there's a huge bridge, starting from Oracle issues to actual transfer, are you going to use fiat, are you going to use tokens? There's a lot of things that needs to be solved, but, uh, but I think uh, we're moving in the right direction and there's uh, different players and, uh, in the industry right now are, that are trying to solve this issue. Actually, we're creating a whole new terminology. How many people here have heard about digital, which is physical and digital merging together? A few. So there's a little bit of a merge between the two worlds. Along the titles of innovative and tokenization, one of the things when we do a blockchain is we want to change the world. So we have things like SDGs, Sustainability Development Goals. 
So one of the things that we're trying to tokenize is carbon credits and trade carbon credits to change the behavior of corporations uh, to allow them to move to more greener technologies. So what's your opinion on tokenization of uh, carbon credits as an example? I, I think it's a great example, right? And I, anything that helps save the world is definitely a goal that I, am, I, I stand for. Uh, I, how there is the carbon credits industry is definitely very, very murky right now because it's a new industry. There's a lot of double accounting that happens where carbon credits are not accounted for properly. I think tokenization will take away those issues that the industry is facing right now because you can't, on the blockchain, you can't create a double token. You can verify the contract in a second. So I think the uh, double accounting issue that carbon credits face is a very big, uh, big issue that can be solved with tokenization of carbon credits. Uh, I have a couple friends invest, invested in working in this space. I advise a company called Menthol Protocol, Max on stage and the other stages right now speaking about this right now. So from, I don't know the industry that deep, but from what I do know, I think the double accounting issue is what is very important, needs to be solved, and that can be solved with tokenization. So overall, sustainability, green finance, definitely something we should look into. Even if it's tokenization or not, yeah, it doesn't matter. But overall, it's a really important point is like uh, this double certification, for example, yeah, that there's a lot of scam in this market. And definitely with the blockchain, for example, this can be solved, yeah. So really to have like this one proof on the blockchain, they'll say, okay, that's just one certificate, yeah, not two or something like this, yeah. So, so I think the tokenization is going to create lots of auditing jobs. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, exactly. There you yes. go. Jason. Yeah, I mean, listen, carbon credits are a great, you know, a, a, a great use case. Uh, one of our partners, Engine Starter, is building the, the carbon credit sort of infrastructure for Palau, the, the country of Palau. And Palau is a tiny nation. It's only got 20,000 people in the entire, you know, it's a small group of islands. Um, and essentially, tokenizing this allows them to compete essentially on a world scale. With, with, with anybody and essentially provide that, you know, uh, uh, carbon offsets, carbon credits and things like that to people that, uh, and essentially compete on an equal footing, right, when you have that technology. So I, I know one of our partners is working very closely with them. I think it's, you know, I think it's great. Anything that helps the environment, you know, makes it more sustainable, that's, that's, that's something that we, that we support. Jon. Honestly, I don't know much about the carbon credit industry, <laughs> but um, I know there's a demand there and a lot of the uh, big Korean cor corporations that front, um, Carbon credits and trade carbon uh, credits are um, moving forwards, uh, forward to uh, tokenization or um, uh, I'd say uh, liquid, liquidation. Well, we live in a very fast paced world, uh, meaning I've been in technology for almost 35, 36 years, and it's a bit like the fashion business. We need to move fast. If we don't move fast, the attention span moves somewhere else. Blockchain has been with us between 14 to 15 years. In 14 to 15 years, if you do a search for blockchain on Google, you probably find something like 4 billion entries. Chat GPT has been with us for a month, and you probably find close to maybe 7 or 8 billion entries when you do a search for Chat GPT. So this rapid shift, maybe there's another attention coming at us from the right-hand field, which means that the blind spot, and what i really trying to mention to you is that data is the new oil, and ChatGPT has been able, or artificial intelligence. So what about tokenization of data, tokenization of artificial intelligence, so maybe the two worlds can co collide and be monetized? I definitely agree with you when you say data is the new oil. I would say ChatGPT is like a refinery that's refining that oil, and that's why they are doing so well. I mean, I use ChatGPT all the time, and it's very, very powerful. How do you tokenize that data is definitely going to be an interesting uh, opportunity if you think about it. Um, yeah, so overall, from my perspective, um, ChatGPT, of course, everyone knows like what's, what's going on there, right? Super market, really, really huge market, yeah, really high valuation, everything else. But um, data new oil, totally agree. Um, I think it, we are definitely too far away from this kind of stuff. Yeah, if, if you think about like tokenization right now and we discuss about real estate, yeah, like real estate, like a physical piece of building standing somewhere. And now we're talking about like data, which is like for us like invisible. Yeah, so I think like right now we're too far away. Definitely it will come for sure. Uh, we'll be interested to see, as you said, like what will happen with the tokenization stuff. Yeah, but uh, even if I asked you guys before, like, okay, who of you guys have a security token right now? Yeah, so it was really not a lot. And therefore, I think, like, it will come, but we should take care of other things first. 
I think like it's all about building infrastructure, right? The thing is, once you build that infrastructure, it all comes together. The thing is, technology doesn't grow linearly like most industries. It grow 20, 30% a year, every year. Technology goes like a J-curve. You grow, go like this, and once you hit that J-curve where you have that infrastructure, you go like a rocket. And that's how all technology has ever grown. So I do think that we are, we are reaching that point very, very quickly where, yes, we are tokenizing real estate, but as that is happening, I, w I was hearing about tokenizing real estate 2018. There are companies that have been trying to do that since many years. Now the infrastructure layer has existed because there's, there's so much regulatory hurdles with assets. I think you will not have those same regulatory hurdles when you're tokenizing data because data is not looked as the same kind of asset as real estate is. So I think there may be the case that we, are, we reach the same level of data being tokenized, the same level of real estate tokenized in a very near future. And that's the beauty about AI, that AI can actually do all of that itself. What would be interesting is the difference between ChatGPT 3.5 and ChatGPT 4 is 2.5 magnitudes higher. The, 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 the AI is trained on like, I think 170 more times data than the last 3.5 AI was trained. Now, which AI wins is gonna be who has access to the best data. So that is, that's what is, now if you are a data, somebody who owns that data, you could tokenize your data and sell that. I think that's definitely gonna be interesting. You can right now use ChatGPT AI and give contextual data about yourself. I, my team is already building Evan AI. So my followers can go on my website and talk to an AI that knows about me and it's like they're talking to me. So, cause I'm not accessible, but my followers can talk to Evan AI. Now that data was, that I have shared with that AI was only available to me. So I could have tokenized that data and sold it to another somebody else and they could have built Evan AI. So it's like real deep fakes. Exactly, so it's like real, it is, it's, that's, I think that's what is gonna be interesting when I see that you can actually tokenize data points that would be unique to certain people. Like some people collect data that nobody else has but are interested in. And I think if you can tokenize that data, that is also very, very interesting. Uh, Jason. Yeah, so I think it's interesting. You mentioned the number of searches for ChatGPT. Probably about half of those searches are other robots trying to figure out what's going on and then like learn more about ChatGPT. But I think, uh, uh, you know, a lot of, what I'm really excited about is a lot of companies that are integrating ChatGPT into their current model, right? One of the companies I advise, a company called Project Lambo, it's a game. Uh, essentially, the playable, non-playable characters are built off of, uh, the, the conversation is, is generated by ChatGPT, which basically means they can't really differentiate between like who's a real player and who's not. Uh, and then, of course, if that, that company ends up having a token, in, in essence, you're really tokenizing the, the AI ultimately, right, in a sense, because people are buying the tokens because they want to play, play the game, and the game is only useful because, you know, you have AI as an integral part of that. So I think that is going to be a really interesting thing to look at, kind of like how does AI interact with our existing technologies, how does it extend and make it more valuable, uh, and then sort of how it makes those, to, those companies, like how it adds value to those companies and what they're doing. So I think that, you know, you're not really tokenizing the AI itself, but you're tokenizing the use case around that AI. Uh, um Data is super important in real estate, I think, because how do you put a price in a real estate property? Like, do you ask the owner, or do you look at the um, you know, properties that are similar and that are around the vicinity? The, the, the disparity of information for real estate property value is very, very difficult and very, very local. So. For us to uh, put a true value in a, a certain property or investment, we what we do is uh, we usually gather um, history of information or data or, or um, bring data sets from other um, Oracle providers or other uh, other intelligence agencies, and to tokenize that data and to uh, so that people can be more um, uh, engaging uh, to to provide data. I think it will be very important, and I think it will be um, a, a good way to uh, place value in the future of tokenization of assets. So one of the important things when we talk about tokenization, it really means that you need to have some regulation, you need to have some certification and audits. So here, more closer to home, I think there's quite a few people here from Hong Kong, there's the SFC, which is the regulatory body, has re recently issued the document paper on um, security tokens, and I think one of the local organizations has already obtained the first uh, capability to operate or issue uh, digital assets that are uh, securities instead of just utility tokens. So I want maybe our panelists to also expand how they see the importance of the regulatory body as well uh, in giving credibility to this industry of blockchain tokenization and sec securitization as well. 
So I think everyone saw what happened uh, last year with uh, FTX, and I don't want to repeat everything else, but I think you know what happened. And um, what, what's happening right now in this wave is that you just see that really, really big and large institutions are currently coming into the game, and they are all regulated, they are all the huge banks. And I think that the regulator himself, like the SFC in Hong Kong, plays a really important role. Because for me, I think if you talk about tokenization of assets or security tokens or whatever, um, it has to be regulated to get like into the mass. Yeah, if not, it's really be really, really difficult. And most of the people or the, 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 the persons who are really interested in this kind of topic will be still the crypto natives. Yeah, but the question for me is, for example, how can you reach, for example, everyone, yeah, every private investor, every retail investor, and so on. And I think this has only happened with regulation, and therefore I think that regulation is really, really important right now. I think regulation okay. by itself is a solid opportunity to tokenization space because regulation, every country has a different regulation, but you can also, for example, what I've seen is that projects which I advise, what they've done is they have bought an entity from a, comp a company, in a, bought a property with an entity just in a whole different country, and then giving, fractionalizing that and telling it to people from another country. So you can use regulation to your advantage if you do it in the right way. So I think it's gonna be very exciting because now we're moving from a world where there's so much information access available to everybody. Before that was not available, but thanks to the internet, that is now everybody has access to all kinds of information. And now government's gonna to have to compete. They're gonna to have to compete and provide better regulation so that they can attract the innovation and that that's how the economies will grow. So the countries which take the first step and they make it easier, to tokenize assets and they make it easier for people to tokenize securities, those countries will win. And living in a global world, I mean, we're already seeing people becoming very global. I mean, most of the crypto people, they, they travel all the time. They have a jurisdiction somewhere, residency somewhere else. Yeah, I think what's really important is that uh, all the regulators in the world are not over-regulating this kind of yeah. things. Yes. Yes. Yeah, for example, if you hear now that in the US they say like uh, Ethereum is a security, so okay, they may be shutting it down. So yeah. everyone will move out of the US probably. Yeah, so overregulation could kill this whole market. That's but, what's already happening, right? Why do you what? think all the exchanges register outside of the US? They're trying not to cater to US users. They have all these issues, and that's why the US users don't have access to the best crypto products. And they all have to find loopholes and sign SAFs under the name of their assistants or something, or find different residencies to be able to do all of this. Yeah. You, you have competition between countries and even within a country. If you look at a place like the US, you go to Delaware, you can register a company, but no. Uh, tokens are really fully allowed, so you have to go to another place called Wyoming, which allows, and so on. So it's a big maze. Jason, I think one of the challenges about tokenization and you know asset tokenization generally, we think of them as securities, and certainly they're being regulated in several places as securities. I think one of the things that it, that, that people aren't thinking about is like retail investors are out. Once you talk about securities, retail you mentioned retail investors. Retail investors can't invest in securities. For the most part, you have to be an accredited investor to invest in securities, right? So once you bring in, once you start talking about regulation and securities, that basically brings out, takes out the retail investor altogether. So now you're talking about, you know, accredited investors or institutionals. So there's, I'm not sure that, you know, providing regulation really opens it up for retail investors. In fact, it actually closes it for the most retail investors. It opens it up for accredited re investors that might be retail investors or might have previously been retail investors and the institutionals. So, so as a use case uh, for you guys, yeah, so tokenization of uh, assets in Germany. So the regulation is clear, and um, we're also targeting, for example, retail investors, so that's possible. Yeah, but for example, if I talk now with the SFC, and uh, I already know now yeah, that they will not target retail investors for security tokens. And also if they bring out, for example, cryptocurrencies, it will be like Bitcoin and Ethereum, and that's it. Yeah, so definitely these kind of, it, it has to be more open up and see like what's happening globally, yeah, and maybe adapt like to better regulation. Yun? Um, regulation is important, I guess, because, um, you know, investors need to be able to claim their rights, you know, and uh, exercise their rights. But uh, with regulation, it involves the government, and in Korea, in the instance of Korea, um, I, wish, I really wish they could make up their minds, <laughs> because um, for, for the past six, uh, seven years, uh, we've been talking to the Korean government on how to... Um, properly um, implement um, the tokenization of assets. But every year they have a different strategy. Every year they have a new, um, I wouldn't say bureaucrat, a new, new official uh, coming in and asking the same kind of information and demanding the same kind of um, um, you know, industry feedback. But in the end, um, most recently, um, the Korean government has published their new guideline 
and it has nothing to do with innovation, nothing to do with the blockchain industry. It's just all back to you know securities, uh, security commission, and traditional framework of uh, how to handle and how to custody um, assets. So uh, that's my only concern. I I, and I hope um, you know the government should uh, would move forward to uh, continue to uh, you know bring and um, uh, promote innovation. Actually, one of the things is Evan and I happen to spend a lot of time in a country that doesn't differentiate between securities or utility tokens. Essentially, both of them are equally bad, right? So, so I mean, there, there's certainly a lot of help for secure for, for regulation. There's certainly a lot of hope for that, but I'm not sure in certain countries whether whether it would quite take, particularly in you know one particular large country that 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 seems to hate uh, crypto people. Um, one of the things I think is important is to enhance and simplify tokenization. So some people are simplifying tokenization by using, uh, instead of fungible tokens, non-fungible tokens, just because somehow there's a bit of more fashion towards fungible tokens. Other people are using other elements like DAO or decentralized autonomous organization to allow you to have uh, governance tokens and to make or vote in the decision-making process that is happening in the tokenization of these assets. So I want uh, our panelists to maybe delve into how can we enhance asset tokenization either through NFTs or through DAOs or other mechanisms to make it more accessible. I mean, like what yeah. uh, Jason was saying, right? And in a, in a country like India, they don't really differentiate between security tokens, utility tokens. I think in that case, then it really, that's one of the biggest advantages of this is that you can open up the asset secur securitization uh, uh, to everybody, to the retail industry also. So those guys eventually could also have a, before, like look at an industry like cars, right? When you buy a car, a normal average car, like, the minute you buy it, it loses 30% of the value when you take it off the lot. You buy a Ferrari or you buy a Lamborghini, it doesn't lose value, it goes up in value. So the more expensive things are, the, it, that's how the industry, luxury industry actually works. Same with a watch. You buy a Casio or you buy a G-Shock, loses value right away. You buy a Richard Mille, you, it goes up in value. So if you, if you can start tokenizing assets like that and giving the retail people access to the same opportunities previously reserved to the elite, I think that is the most exciting part about also. And I think with DAOs, we're seeing this happen already. I, I, got in, I was not a watch guy. I got interested in uh, watches. I joined a watch DAO. It taught me a lot. It's like... Now we are investing in watches through this DAO together. I started buying a lot of my own watches, and I'm also making more money there. So I think that's a really, really exciting part is that this luxury segment, this, when you, and this is with any kind of asset. Like, rich people normally don't lose money when they buy things. When the average man, he buys something, he loses money on that thing right off the bat. And I think giving access to these two products that were only accessible to the rich before, but now with tokenization, you can give that to the common man that's the real beauty. And I think that is the real beauty of tokenization, is giving power back to the common man. Poon, um, your opinion on this topic, or Yoon? Oh, yeah. Um, hey, blockchain was invented to prevent a um, single point of failure, right? I think people still believe in this. And that's why uh, I think DAOs exist. Uh, because, uh, you know, in, this is, in decision making, there's also, there can also be a single point of failure. So for us, what we do is uh, when we acquire real estate property, we ask our DAO to um, give feedback on whether we should, you know, tokenize this or not. But it, it cannot be done if there's a, um, if, if, if there's a, it, it can't be just done on goodwill. We need to, uh, um, you know, give some kind of, um, you know, incentive to participate in decision making. And I think that's why, that's how, that's why we also need tokenization of DAOs and to provide incentives for people to, you know, participate and engage in, um, um, decision making and, 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 and to move on as a, like a, a big community or, a, a, or an entity. So, so I yeah. totally agree with uh, NFTs and collectibles. I think this is a perfect use case in general uh, regarding DAOs. Also, my name is DAO, yeah, but still um, not 100% sure like if we really should t take this matter into the sole tokenization process right now. Because uh, if I talk about DAO itself, it's mostly like for crypto people. Yeah, or for crypto natives, because if you still talk like to people outside of this, if you go out of this building and talk to someone and ask them, like, what's DAO? Yeah, it's probably my name, but not like an uh, autonomous organization or something like this. Yeah, and uh, that's why I think like NFTs, collectibles, totally makes sense. DAO, 
potentially later, you had to really involve like people yeah. in this whole decision making process. But um, also like if we think about how can you make it easy, for example, in a later stage for normal people to involve on these, in these kind of things. Yeah, not like creating your own wallet over MetaMask or whatever. Yeah, it has to be like really, really simple for everyone to join. Jason. Yeah. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, again, whether it's a DAO, whether it's an NFT, it's really just about locking value within, within something, right? I mean, DAOs at a certain layer where, you know, people vote and things like that. But if the thing doesn't have value, then there's, there's, no, there's no sense in it. NFTs are really interesting because you can really lock in pretty much whatever value you want into an NFT and make sure that, you know, other people get it. Uh, I think, you know, but again, if there's not value, it's not, you know, nobody's going to bother buying it. Like the Porsche thing, uh, I'm sure that Evan doesn't buy too many Hubler watches, you know, because it doesn't hold value, right? It's one of those things. I think we're getting towards the end of our session. So what I want to do is to give um, our esteemed panelists each one a chance of maybe like a one minute closing remarks or what you consider to be your, the secret sauce towards uh, asset tokenization. I think we already said everything I had to say. That was great. The only thing I'll tell you guys, the best way to predict the future is to go build it. You want to ask about the future? Go start building it. So, so for me, uh, tokenization of everything, it's already in the, in the world since 2017. Yeah, and uh, I think what's really important, make it as easy as possible for everyone to join. And that's like really like user-friendly infrastructure and all these kind of things. Yeah, and definitely explore this kind of stuff. Jason? Yeah, I think, you know, the, people have said tokenize the world, and I'm definitely for that, because you can definitely, you know, trade value. It's just about trading value. So tokenize the world, and let's do it. Um, all I can say is uh, come to Korea, guys, and find out. Uh. <laughs> well, uh, Korea is very amazing, especially in this new gaming and metaverse, but that'll be a topic for another panel. I would like to thank uh, Ivan, Fon, Jason, Yun. Uh, and the you, audience Doug. for staying with us and, uh, you know, please uh, network with these smart guys um, after the panel. I think maybe we have one last photo and thank you very much. Thank, thank you, guys. you so thank you guys. much for the great discussion. Please remain on stage and come to the center and take the uh, group photo.